Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us to another episode of the CMASK podcast. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. Stephen Baskerville, joining me and Nick and Mike today to discuss his new book, Who Lost America? You can get your copy on Amazon now. I'd highly recommend it. This, in some ways, is like the capstone to Dr. Baskerville's work so far, and it overlaps with what we like to talk about on the CMASK podcast, which is how patriarchy has been attacked and how we can rebuild it. So, Stephen, if we just start with a quotation from your book that, to me anyway, summed up so much of what we talk about on this podcast and so much of what you've written about before, is this. The revolt against the father is an existential revolt against all authority, a kind of permanent revolution for its own sake that can only end in nihilism. Now, that's a great expression of why patriarchy matters and why the attack on it is so dangerous. And that's really what your new book is about, isn't it? Uh, it is in many ways, yes. It shows how the, uh, the attack on the father uh, writ large uh, ends up being a attack on all uh, authority, uh, and therefore a, a, a the, the logical conclusion to that is is nihilism. Yes, yeah, is, is nihilism. I don't um, object necessarily to uh, criticizing authority, and I think uh, one of the roles of a father is uh, to give us someone to rebel against. I mean, I know in my childhood I rebelled against my father, like many of us do, but my father also uh, taught me how to how to how to rebel against him. Uh, more constructively than I was doing. So he taught me, he didn't prevent me from rebelling completely, but he taught me to rebel in a way that was constructive and um, helpful. So this was a this was a big lesson. And I think when we rebel against someone that we love, we learn to love uh, those uh, against whom we rebel, such as the, you know, the larger society and the political authority. So I think it's a, it's the first lesson you have. It's part of the the patriarchal institution is to learn how to how to rebel constructively against your father. And when people don't have those boundaries, when they can't push and then feel that stable but loving push back so they can find themselves in that tension, what happens? Because I've noticed if you look at the data on single mother homes, for example, they produce the worst outcomes for children generally, but boys especially. And I'm feeling like since the family is the foundation of society, when we don't have that boundary in the family, we end up not having it in society as a whole. Do you think that's what we're seeing today? Very, very much so, yes. Um, you can see, um, you know, when boys don't have fathers to uh, both constrain their rebellion and to, you know, to try out their rebellion on, um, then what do they do? They, they just rebel nihilistically. They rebel against anything. Um, they seek alternative family structures like uh, like gangs if they don't have a, a, well, a family. And they, um, you know, they rebel against the society. They rebel against uh, everything. Um, it's, it's a, you know, Lord of the Flies type of environment. And, um, you know, they rebel against things. And you can see this now in the rebellion of woke culture, rebelling against the you know, the symbols of the civilization, the things like statues and literature and music and all of the accepted, uh, the accepted um, icons of the society. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with questioning these things and doing so in a constructive way, but this, this nihilistic uh, wholesale rebellion is the result of this. And uh, we, we all go through, I think, periods of when we uh, um, when we when we want to do that, we want to test the limits. We want to rebel. We're naturally rebellious. It, it starts around adolescence. But uh, if we, those of us with fathers, uh, even imperfect fathers, uh, they teach us how to do this uh, in, a, in a constructive way. Whereas if you don't have one at all, then you end up, uh, you know, rebelling against everything. And um, it's not healthy. There's so much there. I just want to point out quickly that Stephen said even imperfect fathers right and that applies not just to fathers but to husbands too the the submission the respect for authority does not depend on the personal perfection of the person in authority 
it's the structure itself. So a husband is the priest, prophet, king of the household, the authority figure as father and husband, even though he's not perfect. Because what you'll see sometimes from the trad world is women who will say, well, the man just has to step up and then I will submit. And what they mean by that is when you're perfect, then you'll get submission. But of course, perfection is something that none of us reach on earth. So what they really mean is no submission ever because it's conditional on perfection. But I wanted to hear a bit from Nick and from Mike, who are both uh, reverts, and why the authority structure of the Catholic Church was attractive to you. Because a lot of what Stephen said there is about how young men need authority. You both went through rebellious phases. Uh, Mike in the darkness there with his 800 pound deadlift and his tattoos on his neck. He's the kind of person that people wouldn't want to bump into in a dark alleyway, even though he's got a big heart, big muscles. He's a frightening guy. But here he is on his knees in a structure that says, know your place. Here's the authority. Here's the hierarchy. And you needed that, right, Mike? Absolutely. I, I'm a product of a single mother household. My grandfather was very much there, my, obviously on my mother's side, my mother's father, uh, who provided some boundaries, but not. It's, it's not quite the same thing when it's not your own father. And to your point about boundaries, with a father, with the patriarchal structure intact, even with an imperfect father, you kind of have boundaries to kind of rub up against. But the boundaries allow you not to go too far out on the sidelines. And that's what I found happened to me is I found myself so far out on the sidelines, I didn't really know where to go. And I was trying to guide myself in this. And I stumbled, you know, I ended up in, you know, a, a, a lifestyle akin to male feminism, the red pill being promiscuous and trying to find my way. And then, you know, raised as a Catholic fell away. And much of that I think was due to not having that authority in my life. So I looked at authority as, as a bad thing. And I said, why do we have this Pope? Why do we have this, this hierarchical structure in the church? Now coming back and, and examining myself from the origin point of, well, my number one um, mission as a man and as a father of two girls and as a husband is to guide the souls of my family to heaven. So it would, it would behoove me to look into my theological worldview a little bit more. Because Protestantism has no guidelines, right? It cannot teach anything infallibly. It's all kind of left to private interpretation. And I said, it, I ought to know where I stand on this, on, this, on this spectrum. So looking inward, looking into history and praying a rosary led me back to the church. But one of the most attractive things about the church now coming back as a more mature man was it was in fact the authority. It was patriarchy that attracted me back, that I have now an answer to everything regarding faith or morals that was passed down from the top down, you know, from the, obviously the uh, patriarchy being bimodal in the words of, of Tim Gordon, you have the, the structure of the, 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 the priests and the bishops and, and the Pope, and then us as the laity, it now, it all started to make sense. I didn't, I now no longer had a place where I had to try to interpret this stuff myself. There was a structure, there was order, there was tradition, um, and there was this this top-down, um, uh, I guess you could say, well, yeah, top-down structure and patriarchy that led me back. And it didn't even really matter who was occupying the seat of Peter. I mean, we can have all different opinions on, on Francis, but Francis, in a way, was like the rule-proving exception. And what we were just talking about, too, right, is that even an imperfect father is better than no father because he can get the brothers to the table to uh, solve conflict to understand what the rules are and that ultimately that the church was was protected by the holy spirit so that's ultimately what led me back it was was patriarchy and to your point will about um you know the trads saying you know uh you know man up or you know love me like christ loved the church and i'll submit essentially that's operating within the frame of what how a woman views god and not submission to god himself so it's like the gas pedal and brake pedal of feminism is the brake pedal is toxic masculinity you got to stop and the gas pedal being man up and sort of that causes all kinds of confusion because when you take the head off in 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 the home only chaos ensues right and it ensues not just in the home but in society at large uh, plato has a point in 
the Republic about how the city is basically the soul of the ruler writ large. And he talks about the different regimes and how they are reflections of different spiritual states. And Stephen's book is very much about how we are seeing the spiritual disorder of a society that revolts against patriarchal authority manifested in our current political landscape why it is so hellish. That's ultimately what it's about. We tend to talk mainly about the family, but of course society builds on the family. And Stephen's saying, look at the symptoms in wider society that are now so plain that you have to be insane to deny them. Nick, how did the role of authority come into your decision-making when you came back to the church? The way I describe it is that I lost. <laughs> I was vanquished. Um, and so the authority was made plain to me. Because when you when you rebel, especially against like the church, there's an implicit belief that you have an infinite capacity for understanding and for attaining truth, which is what I wrote on for the better part of a decade. This belief that if I just continue to read books and listen to podcasts and apply my mind that I could achieve uh, all of, or at least a sufficient amount of truth to feel at peace in my worldview. And I never felt at peace and I never got there. Um, and eventually I felt like I was beaten into submission by the church as if it were a person as if the, the church itself were a person. Um, however, on my way back, I did recognize intellectually that the only contender worthwhile for me was the Catholic church because it was the only church that proposed absolute in, uh, infallibility on everything, which is the most insane proposition. Like I knew I didn't have to spend time investigating alternative worldviews because the only religion that said you know, try me. Like we literally have it perfect through and through was the Catholic church. And I was like, dang, like that's such a ballsy proposition to make. Like, okay, let me just see what, you know, what happens here. Um, so I felt like the demonstration of authority was just so obvious. And I was, you just need a little bit of humility to realize that you're not going to figure it out yourself. And, and then I, I think, most people would be folded by the potency of the church. Reminds me of a line from St. Augustine, the peace of all things is the tranquility of order. So coming back to an ordered hierarchy has brought both of you peace. And we see that when men lack that, Families also lack peace. Society at large lacks peace. And Stephen, one of your most intellectually arresting and energizing points, for me anyway, that you're making, not just this book, but your previous book too, The New Politics of Sex, is that the welfare state is the original deep state. I haven't heard anybody else make that as clearly as you. People are afraid to say that. Could you tell us a bit more about what that means? The welfare state is the original deep state. Yes, the welfare state um, is one of the most uh, innovative developments in Western history, political developments. It's uh, it appealed to a very basic need, uh, the, uh, the role of the poor, the fate of the poor in industrialization, which was uh, very um, bad in many ways. Uh, uh, the, the capitalism did, in the long run, make everybody wealthier and elevate everybody's uh, standard of living. But in the short run, it does cause hardship for some people. And this is the problem of modern industrial society: is that we, you know, we do create a, every society creates a, an underclass of the poor. Well, the Americans dealt with this in a specific way by creating the welfare state. A little, as did the Europeans, but the American system was a little more. Um, stark in many ways. We uh, we had this idea that we could create uh, the welfare system. Americans didn't like socialism. We didn't like communism in theory. 
So instead, they created this welfare state where which, which would take serve as a kind of safety net for the poorest in society, but everybody else was expected to get on by their by their hard work and uh, and um, you know innovations and so forth. Um, well, that was a, it was a good idea in many ways. The problem was that it created an underclass of the most poor, and it it made those of the rest of us in the middle class feel good about what we were doing. We'd taken care of the poor. We had you know gotten them out of our sight. We didn't have to look at them anymore, and we could tell ourselves that everything was okay. Um, but we also created a kind of underclass of the most poor and destitute, and uh, the most, um, in many ways, the most hopeless. But worse than that, even worse than that, or what consigned them to that status, was we created a um, bureaucracy. We created an army of functionaries who had a vested interest in keeping them that way, like all bureaucrats. Uh, they had a vested interest in perpetuating and even exacerbating the problem that they were designed, they were there supposedly to solve. So we had, we created this army of professional social workers who uh, with a vested financial interest in perpetuating and entrenching the very poverty they were supposed to solve. Let's go back a little bit. You know, you go back to the 19th century in America and in England uh and even or the 18th century even uh what was the problem who solved the problem of poverty well what the church did the church did and it was largely in the hands of women who were organized by the church supported often financially by their husbands on a volunteer basis uh, in intact families and they would go out and they would uh, take care of the poor uh materially and give them food and and um, money sometimes and resources but they also did what they they accompanied that with a, a christian message of sexual immorality sexual abstinence um and this actually was quite effective it did a lot to um so strike at poverty at its very root and it created the, the powerhouse the economic powerhouses of the 19th century like england first of all and then America, and then other other Western countries. Well, in the 20th century, from about the, from the beginning on, these women, uh, amateur women, in the church began to be replaced with professional social workers. Jane Addams, who was an ideologue of anarchism and socialism, uh, began to professionalize the 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 profession of of social worker, and uh, this did two things. It gave the social, made it social workers professional, and it um, gave them an interest, again, in perpetuating the problem they were supposed to be solving. And it also um, tended to uh, in, invoke ideology. Many of these early social workers were uh, Marxists or anarchists and increasingly feminists. So ideological hostility to men um, dovetailed very conveniently with bureaucratic self-interest to have a very, um, to, to work essentially to marginalize men from the family. And it, it wasn't always overt, you know, but you, you could see this even in the New Deal and the anti-poverty programs. And it became more pronounced up into the 1960s with the great society programs of the LBJ and uh, anti-poverty programs. And all of these programs, what nobody ever really uh, points out of these programs even today is that, you know, uh, is that the, well, first of all, the, what it did was it created the permanent poverty, of, especially the African-American uh, uh, community in America, especially, but also others, Appalachia, uh, other low-income communities, Indian reservations, they were also caught up in this. Um, but the African-American community especially was caught up. The, the striking thing about this welfare system is it did not help African-American men in any way. It was entirely designed as a system of poor relief that would help African-American women and low-income women and other minority women. And not only did it help the women, the women were recipients of the of the aid, but it also gave them aid, which allowed them to effectively emasculate the the men. Uh, the man, men became superfluous as providers. They became superfluous as protectors. Um, and so, you know, the, the, everything went to the women and the men were, were, were marginalized. And then, of course, the anti-male ideology simply uh, uh, compounded this. 
Well, um, nobody made a big deal about this. You didn't hear a lot about this. Although if you look back at African-American literature, going back to the 1930s, writers like Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, later on, James Baldwin, um, he's a literary scholar, you're aware of this. Uh, emasculation was a strong theme in African-American literature from early on in the 20th century. So they knew they knew what was going on. Well, it, this didn't have a big um, impact. It wasn't terribly overt. When it became overt was with the 1990s, when Bill Clinton and others had, well, had been pushing for a long time for welfare reform, to lower the cost of welfare, to reduce the cost of welfare, and to um, you know, to make it self-sufficient economically. And this brought in a lot of faux, false, uh, false uh, reforms, the most important of which were things like um, child support enforcement and uh, accusations of domestic violence and accusations of uh, child abuse. Okay, all of these kind of things were pioneered in the welfare system, the American welfare system specifically. Um, these accusations against primarily men in the system, that they were the abusers of children, the beaters of their wives, and they were running away and not paying child support. Well, there was no evidence of this whatsoever, uh, of any of this. I mean, these things happen, of course, but there was no particular evidence that men were um, uh, the main ones that were guilty of this. Uh, and yet what it did was it politicized the welfare system very strongly. Uh, and it, the the social workers, the feminist social workers, became kind of gendarmes. They became plainclothes police. Um, they enforced measures because, after all, enforcing things like child abuse, measures against child abuse, measures against domestic violence, uh, and chasing down child support, these are essentially police functions. So social workers became plainclothes, uh, plainclothes police. And basically, this became a leftist gendarmerie. And if you look, for example, today at the Me Too movement, you know, the way that the uh, these accusations of rape and sexual assault, where do they learn this stuff? It didn't come out of the blue. <clears throat> they learned this from the welfare system. They learned this from the feminist social workers who pioneered these accusations with uh, domestic violence, child abuse, non-payment of child support. They tried it out in the universities where it became sexual harassment and sexual abuse and sexual assault. And then they tried it out on the larger society with uh, political figures like the Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court nominee, and people like the well, your own uh, uh, Duke of York uh, in uh, in Britain was also you know and Bill Cosby of course. So the feminists were the ones that politicized the welfare system and turned themselves into into a constabulary of wealth, plainclothes welfare leftist police. By contrast, you know, there was a there had long been a, a left-wing fantasy among Marxists. They had long um dreamed of politicizing the welfare system and organizing the welfare recipients, and they would rise up and they would smash the capitalist system and they would create a socialist revolution of the poor in society. Well, this never happened, right? This never happened. You, you couldn't do it. Um, so the Marxists and the, the the radical leftists, mainstream radical leftists, never politicized or radicalized the welfare recipients, but the feminists did. Feminists did because they understood the gender specific nature of welfare. They could radicalize the the the, the welfare women, or the, the recipients who were quasi quasi state uh, employees, and uh, basically clients of the state. And they could demonize the men as being so. So the shift, the shift went from the villains of the left went from being uh, militarists and capitalists, uh, you know, and uh, and racists to being uh, men, working class men, deadbeat dads, abusers, wife beaters, child child abusers. Uh, you see how this worked. So, um, uh, and uh, by the way, this was uh, you'll you'll notice this was also the period in the 90s roughly, uh, when um, many working class men, especially white men, but others in places, well, in, in the British Labour Party, for example, the American Democratic Party had, both of these parties had been the parties of working class men, um, working class men who identified uh, with, with uh, socialism, and labor and, and the Democrats. Well, these men began fleeing 
the Labour Party. They began to and the, and the Democratic Party and moving to the to the from the far left to the far right. They began joining the National Front, the British Movement, the Republican Party, MAGA Republicans. Um, Blair came, in, Clinton came in in the United States. He was the one that wealth, reformed so-called the welfare system and turned it into a feminist constabulary at about the same time that Tony Blair was um, Americanizing the Labour Party and, uh, and bringing in these ridiculous constitutional reforms like the British Supreme Court and all this stuff. So, um, you know, they were the ones that brought in this third way, so-called, which sounded moderate. It sounded like it was, um, you know, no, no more socialism, no more communism, no more uh, nationalizing industries. We're just, but, but identity politics became the big thing. Fem, um, uh, racial politics, environmental politics, and above all, above all, far and away the most important, sexual politics. So this was the, the 90s was in many ways the watershed. This was when you got the hysteria about deadbeat dads uh, oh, wow. and the need to lock up as many fathers as possible uh, for non-payment of child support, which, by the way, was a hoax. And so the welfare state became more and more authoritarian. It became oh. in Britain. Uh, they, they outlawed paternity tests. It's illegal, I believe, to this day in Britain to take a paternity test in order to avoid paying child support. So in other words, uh, uh, innocence is no excuse, right? <laughs> the fact that it's not your child is no excuse. You still have to pay child support. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that the authoritarianism of the welfare state uh, was um, was amazing how, how this took place, but, but it's unmistakable. And I think, and because the welfare state is a component, it, it's a basically a creation of the judiciary and the uh, you know, and the, and the, and the, and the bureaucracy, uh, the civil servants. Uh, it was not difficult from here to politicize the other components of the, um, uh, the judiciary, the, 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 the Justice Department, the other forms of law enforcement, like the, uh, um, you know, the Homeland Security, the FBI, the CMA, MI6. Uh, so um, I, I believe firmly, yeah, that the, the welfare state uh, set the model. And, <clears throat> In my chapter on the military, if you look at it, I won't go into this in detail, but I described the military as being a giant welfare state, which it is in the US. Yeah, you make the great point that there's no more powerful weapon than the institution that has all the weapons. And that's why they want to feminize the military most of all. You won't hear Many of those points that Stevens just outlined so efficiently and articulately anywhere else all put together like that because people are afraid to get fired. So go back over, re-listen. A lot of that is really hard to come by. The key point is that the weaker the family, the stronger the managerial state has to be to mop up the mess, right? The key thing is right at the beginning of what Stephen is saying is that it used to be the case that they tried to get the poor to exercise Christian sexual morality because that was a way to reduce poverty, stop the breakup of the family. But what did the feminists do? Well, they specifically aimed at promoting promiscuity. They wanted the fragmentation. And the irony is that it's not really patriarchy versus no patriarchy. It's that the husband as the patriarch the provider the protector gets supplied <clears throat> excuse me gets supplanted by the welfare state as big daddy patriarch it's uh, patriarchy uh, as we understand it in the family versus this big state patriarchy and all the single mothers uh, in a way arranged into this harem and it becomes a kind of modern day slavery for these guys who have to pay child support, even when it's not their child. And I think you see it with the black community, especially because it's just a continuation of the tradition of buck breaking and emasculation. And in some ways, what you saw in the ghetto communities first was like a foretaste of what the plan was for Western man in general. It just begun there. And now we're seeing it being rolled out. And the saddest thing is that, as we talked about before, with Nick, Tim, Mike as well, 
most conservatives are on board with it. Deep down, most so-called conservatives are just feminists. Why is that, Stephen? That's a very um, hard nut to crack. That's a very hard thing to explain, but you're absolutely right about it. I go into that in some detail in the book. Um, and it's uh, it's quite amazing. I mean, there's various theories about this that, you know, the, the chivalry instinct, the, um, you know, the, the, the competition between men, the desire of some men to ensure that other men don't succeed. Um, uh, some, some, of the, some of it is political uh, opportunism. You know, the feminists are on the way up and they want to ride the coattails, uh, the skirt tails of the, of the feminists. And uh, uh, But this is a very perplexing thing. Yes, it is absolutely. Um, they, will, they will attack, they will criticize the feminists when it comes to uh, abortion. Uh, and that's about all. Uh, not much more than that. Um, and and they will take the feminist side when it comes to when the feminists start attacking what they call male puerility or you know this idea they they preach it to men you know man up get get married uh, uh, have a child uh, Senator Josh Hawley is the latest of this with his book um, uh, I forget what it's called but he you know he says um, young men need to grow up and get married. Uh, well, um, that's all very well, except that, that, you know, I believe that too, in principle. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, every man, uh, virtually every man outside the priesthood should, uh, you know, should answer the calling to become a father and a, and a husband. And it's the greatest joy in life. I mean, I wouldn't see a man denied any of that. But if you're, uh, you know, if you know that any child you have, can be taken away from you at the whim of the state through literally no fault of your own. That's the law, no fault justice. And through no fault of your own, your child can be taken away from you. You can be enslaved for 18 or more years to, to, to make payments for a child you're never allowed to see or raise or have any authority over or determine how he, he or she comes out, um, it turns out in life. Uh, I mean, this is this is this is, okay. and and you can be criminalized. You can be, you know, you can end up in the uh, in the in North America. It's the worst, not so bad yet in Britain, but um, you know, you can be uh, criminalized for any number of things. See, seeing the child out of uh, uh, without government authorization, you can be you can be arrested or, or not paying the child support, you can be arrested. Bogus accusations of domestic violence, you can be arrested. Uh, violating a restraining order, you can be arrested. I mean, there's all these ways of not only emasculating and marginalizing and eliminating the father, but criminalizing the father. I mean, and you know, even a short time in the pokey, uh, even if it's just a few weeks or months in the pokey, I mean, that leaves you jobless often and homeless. And you look at a men's shelter and ask the ask many the men in the men's shelter. How many of you went, you know, became homeless as a result of divorce proceedings? And virtually all the hands will go up. Chilling. Nick, you are a young guy who is hoping to get married. You know the full reality of everything that Stephen has outlined there. Yet, you still want to get married. Now, some people take the opposite view. They take into account that landscape that Stevens just sketched and they say, not for me, too much risk. The ones who are morally minded will stay celibate and respect to them for that, right? Celibacy is actually a, a higher state than the married life as the Catholic church teaches. So well done. That's masculine, okay? That's a good way of life for a guy to pursue. And I can sympathize with that. If he listens to everything that Stephen set out there and says, I don't feel that it's my vocation, that's one. Or it could be deep down in my heart, I would like to be married, but I just don't feel that now is the time. On the other hand, though, there's plenty of men who aren't strong enough for that. And remember, St. Paul warns that we one reason we get married is for fear of fornication, right? He understands the frailty of human nature and says, without this, which is a spiritual help for you as a remedy for concupiscence, one of the secondary purposes of marriage, you are likely to fall prey to lust and the devil and temptation, etc. 
I believe that's what tends to happen to most guys who don't get married, just like St. Paul says, okay? And the feminists understand that. Hence, they knew that weaponizing promiscuity would be so effective. But you, Nick, are saying, no, I'm going to go ahead with marriage. Could you tell me a bit more about why that is your mindset and why you're willing to take some of the risks that Stephen's just outlined? Well, the <clears throat> unless you are called to celibacy, I don't think most men have the grace or the constitution to be celibate in a way that is redemptive to them. You know, marriage as I see marriage as a vocation, and that doesn't mean it's an activity that is designed to bring you the most pleasure for the longest period of time. It means it's the vehicle by which you should be sanctified and get to heaven. And the the other way to do that as a man would be celibacy through the religious life. But if you're not called to that, and the vast majority of men are not, then celibacy, even if it's voluntary, um, or singleness plus fornication, in you know both instances, is just going to be a miserable existence. And I see that as uh, an insufficient solution to the the problem of the risk. I don't think that that underwrites the risk of the current state of intersexual dynamics. I also think that it's not actually that hard to vet women. I think that's something that is promulgated by the red pill, that um, women are so deeply enigmatic that they're, they have multiple personalities that you can't come to a meaningful understanding of their nature or predict what it's going to be like in the coming years such that you should avoid getting into some kind of pact with them that we call marriage. Um, I think if a guy is clouded by sin, then it's very easy to screw that up. Right. If he's if he's fornicating, if he's deeply in mortal sin, then his intellect is, is going to be clouded and it's probably a lot easier to screw that up. But that discernment becomes much easier if he spends time in the sacraments and is in a state of grace. Um, but let's say you accomplish all of those things, you're still presented with something that is a, a risk, which is entering a covenant. Um, and then I would revert back to, uh, I think C.S. Lewis talks about in the screw tape letters, there's this covetousness, this possessiveness of our time that uh, Satan likes to leverage, where you get bitter about somebody imposing on your time. Um, and in screw tape letters, he talks about it more in the sense of a day-to-day -day schedule um, that Satan will inflame the bitterness of your heart if you are asked to participate in something that you didn't allow for in your schedule. But I think you can expand that out even further and look at your life as a whole. If you're lucky, you'll hit a century uh, of life on this earth. And maybe this is a very glib thing for a 25 year old to say, but I, you know, I'm not married yet. Let's say you get married at 20. If you're super productive and lucky and everything aligns, you get to get married at 20 and you have 80 years with this person. Mathematically, 80 over in eternity, infinity is functionally nothing, yet it's the most consequential. How you spend these 80 years determines how you'll spend eternity. And given that the price of admission to heaven is virtue and not how great of a time did you have during those 80 years, it would make sense to me that even if you got in a terrible situation with a woman, if you know anything about Christianity, congratulations, you just figured out your exact path to get to heaven. Long suffering, humiliation, chastity, Bearing wrongs patiently. These are spiritual works of mercy. Then you have the corporal works of mercy that you get to perform within your family. So I think it's a very myopic perspective to view marriage as simply a business contract that, like, man, I just really don't want to get screwed on this business contract because, like, that would make me unhappy, as opposed to the vehicle by which you might end up in heaven. So, all that being said, like, 
I'm I'm a risk taking fellow. I do that in many areas of my life. I would much rather take that risk and get married to somebody who I have a pretty good feeling about than any of the alternatives that I've seen. I haven't seen somebody happy Aww. who hasn't at least tried. Great answer. And let's not pretend that there are risk-free alternatives out there. The single life has its risks aplenty. If you look at the stats to do with mental illness, suicide, depression, etc., among never married guys, they are higher than married men considerably. But Nick's overall point there was putting his decision into spiritual perspective, which is the, and it's a hard point to grasp. Success in this life isn't measured just by what you do before you die, right? He's thinking of the eternal things that are at play, the eternal perspective. So your marriage might be miserable in some ways and involve all kinds of suffering. And yet that could be a spiritually good thing for you to have to work through. And when you think about what treasures you're storing up in heaven as a result of that, rather than just in your 401k, whatever it might be, thinking of marriage as a financial tool to improve your material standard of living, then it changes things dramatically. Mike, you are married. You've got two beautiful daughters as well. Some men would think that you spend every day worried about your wife <laughs> just walking away and leaving you and the whole thing coming crashing down around you and that the risk of divorce is so high and they'll point out some of the percentages. Do you ever think about that kind of stuff? I have not ever thought about it really once at all. Um, and yeah, it's not even a worry of mine. And I've said it before that if she got and she wouldn't do this, I mean, but let's let's just say hypothetically it happened. She just got up and took everything. Uh, I would still go back and do it again. Uh, I got my daughters. It's been a, an incredibly it's been the most powerful tool of sanctification for me. And so going back to why I wanted to get married in the first place was, well, number one, I've always felt a call on my heart from God to be a father, maybe because I didn't really have a good one growing up. But since I was a little kid, I just dreamt of having children. So I knew that that was something that was imprinted on me, uh, first and foremost. Um, and, you know, even during the time of when I was, me and my wife were dating, I wasn't at first completely sold on marriage because I had put myself through the red pill meat grinder. And so I had become sort of jaded and pessimistic because, I mean, now looking back, it's because I was digging in the trash and wondering why I was getting my hands dirty, so to speak. <laughs> and so when I met somebody like my wife, I was like, oh, I, this, this person actually very much like inspires me to want to get married. I can see these qualities in her. And I remember holding to this, I'm, we got to get a prenup. We got to get a prenup. And, you know, obviously she wasn't enthused about it, but she's like, okay, whatever. And then I kind of came to a point, I'll never forget that I said, you know what, actually, and many, many guys will probably laugh, laugh at me for this, but this is the reality. I said, you actually inspire me not to want to do that. And I remember this profound moment that we, we, we'd enjoyed together. And so for all of those reasons, you know, she inspired me to do it. I felt this call to fatherhood and left to my own devices. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a selfish person. And this is why I warn against sexual experience that it's not something you get out of your system. It's something you get into your system. Uh, I absolutely think that if I wasn't married, it'd be incredibly difficult for me to withstand temptation and to fight against concupiscence on my own because I've experienced it. That's my sort of cross to bear. So primarily, it was all those reasons. But secondarily is that, okay, well, I can enjoy the fruits of intimacy with my wife and not have to be distracted by this sin that I've, that I've you know, um, participated in for so long. I don't think I'm... Uh, virtuous enough to do that on my own. And I think a lot of the reason I came back to the faith, came back to Catholicism, why, you know, I have changed so much as, as a result of my faith. My first, the best decision I ever made was becoming Catholic again. The second decision was to get married. Had I not done those things, I think I would have been the same man. I don't know what God would have had in store for me had I stayed single, but I can almost stay with a certainty that I wouldn't be the man that I am today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even early on thinking, well, what's the alternative, right? So there's two paths. There's living my life as a single guy and then there's living my life as a father. 
if I'm risking losing everything, but in return, I get children that she has the potential to take away from me. But nevertheless, I get children, just the potential for children. That, that, that's worth the risk for me. That I don't want to be on the other side of like 50, 60, 70 years old, looking back at what if and not having, ch and not having children there, even if they were ripped away from me. Yep. Makes that, sense. That was, that was the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So Nick is saying, so what if it involves suffering? Because that could be good for me spiritually. I also think that I can get a good understanding of the woman that I'm going on this adventure with. And then Mike is basically saying, look, the, the risks are there, but the reward is worth it. Now, to come back to Stephen's position on this, which is currently that there should be a marriage boycott so that men can send a strong enough message to actually get the leverage to be able to regain control of the legal system so that no fault divorce, for example, can be abolished. We can default to father custody after divorce. Stephen, your position is that these things are like the linchpin of feminism. And until those are addressed, until that wow. linchpin is removed, then nothing else we really do is going to have sufficiently strong impact. Am I correct about that? Yes, you know, you are. There are several key points to, to remember in this. One you just touched on. Um, I follow, <clears throat> pardon me, part of my inspiration is the great uh, patriarchal writer, uh, Daniel Amnaeus. And he wrote, and I quoted in the book, that basically the uh, the linchpin of the entire feminist mo movement, uh, the, the the one key principle of, that gives feminism all of its power is uh, mother custody of children after divorce or outside of marriage. Uh, and it, this is by far, and this is consistent with my own personal conviction and experience that uh, this is by far the greatest injustice, the greatest abuse uh, that our governments commit uh, and the greatest, um, well, the greatest abuse that the feminists commit too is taking away a man's children. I mean, the rest we can take. Uh, you know, being slapped by a woman, uh, most men would gradually accept that. Losing a job to a woman, I mean, th th these things are comparatively trivial. Um, but having your children taken away is is the most, uh, is you know, is hell upon earth. Could I, I just add, Stephen, quickly, sorry to interrupt, but this is the thing that best shows why the red pill view of men as naturally built to, as they put it, ejaculate and evacuate is wrong. Why is it that suicide spikes so much when the man is separated from his children? It's because men too are built for monogamy. Like that's a bond between father and child that's not supposed to be broken. So we're not supposed to be careless about our offspring. Just wanted to add that in because it's something that I see a real tension between. On the one hand, there's this promotion of promiscuity by people who don't have the honor and moral dignity to actually say, look, marriage or celibacy. They want to travel this third way in between, which is basically feminist saying, well, let's just engage in promiscuity. Marriage isn't a good deal for men financially, but we still want to have sex, create single mothers. And yet we also want to complain um, about the idea of men being separated from children. Like you can't have both at once. Sorry, continue. No, you're absolutely right. In fact, there's an, um, marriage and fatherhood are inextricable. And men have got to understand that basic principle. Um, if you look back on English uh, law, common law, uh, Lord Mansfield's rule was basically said that the father in the days before paternity testing, uh, it, the father is the man that is married to the mother. Okay, the father is the man married, to, not the sperm donor, the man married to the mother is the father. Okay, so this shows that marriage and fatherhood are inextricable. Marriage defines fatherhood. So if somebody else comes along, uh, and puts his little wee wee where it doesn't belong and makes a baby. He has no legal right to that child. Uh, the, the, the legal father is the, is the husband and it's up to him to decide if he wants to keep that child and raise it as his own, uh, then he has the rights to do that. In English law, uh, the Napoleonic Code said the same thing. So, uh, you know, for men to belittle or uh, dismiss the importance of marriage is very short-sighted indeed because marriage is what creates fatherhood. Otherwise, you're dependent upon a judge 
to issue some kind of uh, you know custody arrangement or some kind of test, uh, oh. which they don't even bother to, uh, oh. to adhere to. So that's you know oh. it's absolutely basic, basically fundamental to English and oh. Anglo-Saxon uh, American law, uh, Western law. So that's that's an important point. But there's also you know there's more to it than oh. that because uh, there is uh, as um, as uh, Mike was saying. You know, this is something um, that, uh, well, I, I want to, I guess I want to contest that what Mike was expressing is something no man should have to do. Um, that, uh, this is something, you know, these are things that we should be fighting against as men, as fathers, as citizens, as Christians, all of these things we should be mobilizing. This is not a state of affairs where, where women can, uh, or courts can steal your children and force you to, to live without them. This is, the, this should be our main inspiration to fight back not only to regain your children from the courts, but to regain your citizenship and your, you know, your sovereign um, citizenship as a, as a member of society. And this is what we have lost today, not just in the area of child custody and divorce, but in the, in the entire uh, area of, uh, of, of the law and of citizenship. Um, this right. is why, for the, and this is a big part of what my book is about, is why for the last four years, especially since and it's primarily located uh, in the, in the United States but the book applies to the other western countries as well but roughly in the months before the Biden administration took power in the months since the covid hysteria uh, that we have basically lost our citizenship in the western world um, we are no longer functional citizens we have farmed it out to lawyers we have farmed it out to pressure groups uh, we have farmed it out uh, to, you know, uh, political parties, um, and we let them speak for us. And they represent us much the way a lawyer represents his clients in a courtroom. And what does a court, what does a lawyer say to a client in a courtroom? He says, "Be quiet and let me do the talking." Right. Well, this is what the pressure groups and the political parties and the lawyers all say to us now. It's no accident that the pressure groups and the political parties and the uh, political institutions, the parliaments, and and are all run by lawyers, attorneys, of various kind of um, because uh, and we are increasingly, you know, citizens. On, we are increasingly defendants on trial. So uh, you know, this should be the, the 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 desire to be a father and to have your fatherhood recognized as a basic, the most basic, fundamental uh, civil right, human right, if you prefer. I prefer civil right. Um, should be the main incentive to 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 uh, preserve and to fight to preserve our our freedom and to exercise your um, you know your patriarchal authority your patriarchal duty to not only to protect your family your wife your ch children but by as an extension of that to go one step further to protect your local community to protect your national community to protect your sovereign state and your your heritage as a as a as a Brit or an American or whatever it is, and only then after that, yes, you can be a citizen of the world if you want to. But the other, you know, the, these priorities start. The priorities should start close to home. So, I have, um, yeah, I have a question, and I'm still trying to piece all this together. So forgive me if it's not a completed thought. Um, but something that I'm that I'm struggling to understand is the attempt to impose secular legal ramifications or mechanisms of control regarding marriage to something that isn't secular. So my understanding of marriage is that it's an indissoluble, indelible mark on the souls of two people who have made a blood covenant before God to deliver one another to heaven that blood covenant is ratified by the state for tax purposes, for legal purposes, so that you're seen as a singular legal entity. But it's a ratification of something metaphysical, not something social. And then when things don't go according to plan or the participants of that blood covenant fall into sin which is inevitable as they will but if it's really bad sin then the response is we will basically push the rope uphill 
and use the state to try and, and inspire less sinful behavior by the participants of this blood covenant. Why would the solution not be an improvement in religiosity as opposed to the arm of the state? Isn't that sort of the same error made by, of like, against the Catholic social teaching of subsidiarity, like local rule, aren't we then giving power to the state to try and, and impose morality? Yes, it's an excellent question, a complicated one, but an important one. Um, yes, we are. And um, there's we can minimize that. I don't think we can entirely eliminate it anymore. Now, of course, at one time, marriage was under the authority of the church, the Catholic church. Um, and it was... Uh, the state had a minimal role in it, but the, the authority were the ecclesiastical courts. Sometime in the early modern period with the Protestant Reformation, the, it was the secular state that took over um, the uh, authority for marriage. Uh, although, if, as I understand it from the history I've read, the Catholic Church went along with that, and it's even in its country, uh, even in Catholic countries eventually. So this this was a went on over the and it, the state increasingly over time consolidated this control over marriage. Now there are people today who will say that we should marriage should be a purely private uh, contract or covenant, whichever you prefer. Uh, the state should have no role in it whatsoever. Um, I, I th that's that's a good idea in in in, in theory uh, because the, the marriage does create a private household. And that private household is a realm of authority that the state should be kept out of. I agree with that. Uh, for example, parents are the only people I know uh, in society that are allowed to use physical discipline, physical punishment on another human being. That is to say their own children. Uh, even that they're trying to curtail, of course, all the time. But, but you know, parents are allowed to use physical punishment up till now uh, to discipline and punish uh you know, their own children, no one else's children, but only their own. Um, so that gives them a realm of autonomy that to some extent is um, sheltered or preserved from the state power, uh, unless with a very strong burden of proof on the state to show that it has some kind of um, legitimacy in entering that private sphere of life. Wow. Now, the one, and so the libertarians will say, well, there shouldn't be, it shouldn't have any Role, the, the marriage should be an entirely private um, contract. The problem, the only problem with that is you have to have a. The state has to recognize a certain private sphere of life from which it must stay out, if, if you like. In other words, um, it, it, for the state to stay out of private life, the state has to recognize uh, they uh, that this is a legitimate marriage from which they are required to stay out of it. So mm -hmm. they can't necessarily, if they want to legitimize any two people or any three people or any four people uh, going into a church and say, we're married now, <clears throat> no matter how many sexes are involved or how few sexes are involved, um, you know, this is a this is a problem. And of course, the other problem is child wow. custody. Who, who do the children belong to? And that, again, we had a very hard and fast rule under Lord Mansfield's law, which is no longer recognized anymore, as far as I know. That the um, but they, then again that depended on the marriage contract. The, the, the father was the was because of course it only matters with the father. The mother, um, the ownership of the child uh, is uh, is obvious for the most part. It's the father's custody of the child that has to be established by some kind of social convention. Um, so the marriage and that's why it's it's inextricably tied to marriage. So I don't think we can really do away with state recognition of marriage entirely. Um, and then, of course, the, this is all complicated by, of course, by welfare provisions and the state gives money to people. I don't think that's essential. I think the welfare provision should be eliminated. But, you know, it just compounds the confusion. Um, but, but the child, the question of, you know, keeping the state out of the family and recognizing child custody is a legitimate reason for the state to at least recognize um the the relationships from which, which it is required to honor if only negatively by staying away from them so i don't think we can entirely eliminate the role of the state um but we could sure we could sure keep it under control we could sure uh that we need citizens parents fathers and churchmen 
churchmen above all, perhaps, who are willing to stand up to the civil authorities and say to oh. them, you are encroaching on God's turf. OK, there is no excuse. You go into a church, you sign a covenant sacrament, if you like. Um, and then a few years later, the state takes that covenant and tears it up. OK, um, and they're not just tearing up the, the 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 secular contract they're they're tearing up the sacred co covenant as well and the uh you know at that point why we don't have churchmen who will walk into that church and say i have standing to say this by the way i consecrated this marriage protestant or catholic as a sacrament it doesn't matter i consecrated this marriage i was the churchman who married this couple i have standing to say something in this court you are encroaching on god's turf you the church the the state authorities, the judge, have no right to tear up this contract or this covenant. Um, and you mobilize the congregation, you mobilize the church, uh, and you you pick at that courtroom and you go in and you fill up that courtroom and you say to the judge, uh, you know, you have no right to do this. This is not a violation of church and state. This is, you know, a separation of church and state. This is um, the, the, the church telling the state when they are overstepping their bounds, encroaching on God's territory. And churchmen have been doing this going back to, you know, Ambrose of Milan, um, uh, the, the the Polish bishop who I, whose name I can't pronounce, uh, who stood up to the, uh, um, you know, the, the Polish kings. Uh, I mean, you name it. There's a, there's a proud history of this. You know, John Fisher and uh, wow. standing up to Henry VIII wow. over this. Uh, there's a pro and, and this carries over into the Protestants too. Uh, you know, you have Richard Vermbrandt under, under communism, the, the 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 Romanian pastor. Um, but this is a you know this is a proud tradition. It's these are the defining moments in not only church-state relations; they are the defining moments in Western history, when brave churchmen stand up and say to the civil authorities, "You are uh, overstepping your bounds." If, and, if if Tim was here, he would probably make the point that. The Catholic Church won't allow people to get married only sacramentally. You have to get married with marriage as a civic institution as well, because the church actually regards the the state as God's turf too. So integralism means that just like every individual has a duty to honor God, so too does society collectively also have that duty oh. Oh. so the marriage is both it's not just the sacrament it's also the civic institution and the mm -hmm. church has an interest in keeping that as part of public life this is why an integralist oh. state for example would make gay marriage illegal because of the grave social evil that it inflicts and no fault divorce certainly would be illegal. So these laws are part of the way in which the church cares for souls, because the purpose of politics, like Plato said, is to make it so that laws are conducive to virtue formation. So it's subordinate to our ultimate spiritual end, because ultimately the only thing that actually matters is that we get to heaven. That's our supreme good, our supreme end. So everything else in life has to be ordered towards that. When you're talking about Protestantism there, I was thinking what a big mistake that Luther made in separating church and state because Aww. the traditional teaching is there's no separation. There's only a distinction. And once you just say, okay, that's Aww. all your business now, the state just becomes secular and the church has no concern with marriage laws for example or we'll just do marriage as a sacrament only then you've already introduced big problems for yourself when you then say as the protestants did that actually you know what marriage isn't even a sacrament at all then you create even bigger problems too so the return i think needs to actually be um in the direction that the church has maintained which is that Marriage is a civic institution and the church asserts itself more fully there as well over the laws in general. So I agree with what you're saying there, Stephen, but just to pick up on Nick's question, it's both. 
and the church takes both seriously. I hear from so many guys saying, yeah, I would get married, but um, nothing to do with the state. I don't want the state involved at all. And the church res regards that as a weak position, as if marriage is being pushed into some dirty corner of a room somewhere as one of those things that you can do in your free time, which is what secular liberalism said about religion generally. Right. Keep it out of the public square. Go do it in your bedrooms in private. We don't want to know about it. So the strongest stance is, no, this is something that we dominate through the law. Does that make sense, Nick? Yeah, I think the, the point that I was trying to make is that um, we the, they're by giving this level of power to the state. Now, I don't even want to say giving that level of power. We're sort of all pretending that when the state says marriage today, they mean the same thing that the word actually means, which is not true. Because if that were the case, then uh, the people who got divorced wouldn't receive communion. Marriage is a sacrament. And then the state comes in and says, okay, you guys aren't married anymore. Nothing actually changed. Like the metaphysical reality is is still the yeah. same. And so I guess all I'm saying is, why are we all pretending that something has changed? Because then we're just like ceding power to the state in a, in a very illusory way. So if the state can say, uh, you guys are no longer married, this child goes with this person, this child goes with this person on Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that. If that takes place, the church should immediately say, and neither of you are receiving communion. But that's that's not happening. So I'm not advocating for a purely sacramental marriage. I'm just saying that the the law change that's being advocated for of like, well, let's do no fault divorce. It's I, I just think it's missing the point. It's like whatever the law is should just be using the word marriage in the same way that the thing actually is. I yeah. guess an example would be if um, if I have a deed to a house. And somebody walks into a courtroom and says, in fact, I would like this house. And the court goes, okay. And they just write on a piece of paper and say, this guy now owns the house. That doesn't actually change the objective truth about property rights or the fact that that is my property or the fact that I spent 25 years laboring to own that house just because the court said so. But for some reason, society is like, man, I don't know, this new guy owns the house now. Well. Well, this is the, this is the um, the supreme arrogance of the state, doesn't isn't it? Because the state um, takes over this power, and the 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 arrogance of the state can be seen in the uh, the claim that it can change the meaning of words. Right, right, right. The, the the state can change the meaning of the word marriage. We can redefine marriage to mean something that marriage is not. Um, this has been going on, by the way, for a long time. The American Congress. Uh, prefaces now its its legislation by saying, for the purpose of this legislation, this word means this, and this word means that, and right, you can't change. It. This is the story of King Canute. You know, King Canute, uh, the famous Viking king of England, who uh, you know he was being flattered, and he he took the uh, the flatterers down to the water's edge. He said, if I stop, you know, stop the order the waves to stop, will they stop? And uh, of course, he ordered the waves to stop, and they didn't stop because there's certain things that the king the king cannot make two and two equal five. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, th this is the kind of thing. So the king cannot, uh, the parliament cannot uh, change the meanings of words. But this is precisely what they were trying to do, and so this is uh, should be taken by us uh, as an indication of just how arrogant um, the state is becoming. The idea that you can legislate. Um, uh, morality, not, not just morality, the idea that you can legislate reality, you can legislate facts. If we pass a law that's saying pi <laughs> equals three, then pi equals three. There's no. a good definition of uh, marriage as a civic institution in the Catholic Encyclopedia. I just want to read it out because I think it really reflects why Stephen's saying what he's saying about the boycott. So I know that Stephen regards the overall purpose of marriage as just patriarchy, right? Put simply, the purpose of marriage is patriarchy. And when you listen to this definition, 
think about how men aren't actually being given what they are owed. So the definition runs like this. Uh, marriage is the civil status of one man and one woman legally united for life with the rights and duties which for the establishment of families and the multiplication and education of the species are or from time to time may thereafter be assigned by the law of matrimony. Now that talk of rights and duties for the establishment of families and the multiplication and education of the species just reminded me of how those are the things that Stephen thinks that men can't currently get. They're owed them, but they aren't getting them, and we need to get them back. Otherwise, patriarchy is the goal of marriage, has too many roadblocks in its way. Have I understood that right, Stephen? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, and I want to make it clear that, you know, I do not advocate um, the marriage strike. Um, well, there's a couple reasons I advocate the marriage strike. One is because it's something men are doing anyway, as someone pointed out earlier. It's a spontaneous action on the part of the, um, oh. the men to, 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 uh, to, now sometimes they're doing it for the wrong reasons. They're doing it as, as Will says, out of uh, fear, out of cowardice, out of uh, uh, the path of least resistance. And that's not a good reason. Uh, you do, a, like any strike, a strike should be a means to an end. It's the purpose is to acquire leverage so that you can join with others and uh, use your collective leverage to force the state to do the right thing. And this is all, the only way. Uh, so so, so my, my argument about the marriage strike is to take what men are doing already anyway. And they're being scolded for it, not not only by feminists, but even more so by conservatives. They're being scolded for this, uh, you know, this this uh, failing to marry and have children. But to take that boycott, that impromptu, spontaneous strike that they are exhibiting, which they're going to do regardless of whether I advocate it, and you channel that into a constructive purpose, so that it's not forever, it's not open ended, it's not indefinite, it's not a lifestyle that you. I don't want men. <clears throat> to have to forego families and children forever, unless they, as you say, they genuinely feel called to it. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, I want this, and I think it could happen relatively quickly. You uh, you know, because the women are already complaining. Where are all the men? Where are the men? The men don't, they, there aren't any men. They don't want to get married, uh, you know, and, and you can you can belittle them and scold them and say they're puerile and they're sitting in their mother's basement playing video games and all this kind of thing. But you know, what good does it do to scold? I mean, scolding never did anybody any good. Um, the women, if they want men to marry, they need to join the men, support the men in this strike and say, we want men to marry, but we want men to marry. We want whole men to marry. We, want, we don't want men who are going to marry us out of fear or marry us because somebody's scolding them or ordering them to marry. We want men who, you know, who are men of integrity in the largest sense of that word. <clears throat> Pardon me men who do this from their own volition, their own free will. Uh, and um, they want to get married because they, you know, they love me and they love God and they love to have children. And, um, you know, the stage, once, once the women start complaining about this, which they should be doing, uh, I think it will get changed relatively quickly. Right. Um, I agree. I think the time is right for men to act and we're certainly not going to scold men who are celibate as your plan requires the scolding would come in where they try to take that third way so you've got monogamy celibacy the third way is promiscuity which is playing right into the feminist's hands it's falling into the honey trap and most guys in fact do actually fall into that contraception goes alongside it so if people are listening thinking about that, then just recognize that contraception, free love, feminism, all those things have always been intimately bound up. That's the trap they're setting for you. Stephen's setting you a hard path, which is the marriage boycott, celibacy. We have advocated the hard path, like Nick and Mike have talked about, of seeing the risks, but recognizing the rewards and having the fortitude to go ahead with it anyway, trusting that you'll get grace from God to fulfill the duties of the married state well 
But those are your options. And if nothing else today, we hope we have clarified those for you. I was thinking, Stephen, your title is Who Lost America? And as I was just pondering the book, I was thinking, well, men did. Men lost America through effeminacy, through conceding too much ground. And it was theirs to lose in the first place. And that's why you finish by talking about how the only way to actually get it back will be um, men having that courage that they should have had in the first place. On the penultimate page, you write that your approach will demand courage and fortitude from men, precisely what the feminist matriarchy wants to eliminate and where the conservative political class has repeatedly shown itself deficient. So what I like about your approach is you are saying man up in a way, in a more nuanced way yeah. than what some of the conservatives who just browbeat men would say. But ultimately, it does come down to showing the courage and fortitude that men have failed to show in the past, right? It really does. I mean, you can't avoid it. There's no avoiding it. If you want male leadership, then, you know, you, you've got to take risks and, uh, you know, there'll be casualties. I, I don't doubt it. You know, men will, men will have to sacrifice uh, a lot. Not every, it won't come. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I said it would come fairly quickly, but uh, there's bound to be people that are going to get hurt because it is a kind of a moral political war. And, uh, of there's course. Always, there's always casualties in that. Right. But, and if, you know, if that's why we have faith in God, because we, one reason, many, but, you know, we, that, that the that the larger cause and the larger uh, uh, purpose will go on, you know, God's work will be done, uh, if not for me and my lifetime, then, you know, for, for others, and then, you know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And all, and all that. That's it. So, and and that political warfare is ultimately a deep reflection of spiritual, spiritual warfare, warfare that you're in, yeah. whether you want to be in it or not. Like the Virgin Mary said, uh, Fatima, the final battle between the Lord and Satan is over marriage and the family. And look, it's been great to have you on our podcast talking to you as one of the people who is fighting on the front lines of that battle and saying some of the things that most people won't say has been a real pleasure. And thanks so much for sharing some of the content in your book. People who've been interested by what we've covered, it's on Amazon, Who Lost America? Stephen Baskerville, I'd recommend having a look at some of his other books too. Material that has been collected and clarified in a way that I'm not aware of anybody else doing. So you'll learn a lot from them. And thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Mike, great to see you. Nick, great to see you too. Any final questions for Stephen before we sign off? No, thanks so much. I'm just excited here, to grab Stephen. this book. And uh, I think it's important. This is a, a really important discussion, especially to the men that are um, in the MGTOW movement. This kind of like puts a different spin on it. It is the virtuous MGTOW movement. And I think people, it, it gets lost on people. Now, I'm not sure if I 100% agree with it, but it's certainly uh, a better alternative. Uh, Stephen, I appreciate your work. Thank you for being here with us today. God bless you, brother. Pleasure's mine. Thank you. Thank you. God bless everybody. Speak to you all again soon. Take care.